Yeah, the public workstation, the ordinance of workstation and rules committee meeting. The first of this one, they are 2017 97, utility dividend calculation, Title 26. We need to go around the room and down for our social record. Fred, let's start with you, sir. Fred Dyson. Felix Rivera. Pete Peterson. Tim Skill. Dick Training. John Wildman. Eric Croft. Go Policy Municipal Journey. We'll turn the time on the administration. All right, just give me 45 seconds here. We're loading the presentation. You've got an agenda in front of you. We're going to try and follow that. So, put one thing on it. Any moment now, we're building anticipation, wetting the appetite. Okay, let's see if this works. Maybe. <coughs> well, oh my goodness, all right. Okay, here we go. So as the chair said, we are here to talk about mm -hmm. AO 2017, I believe it has now been numbered 97. 97. This is the second back by popular demand presentation of this PowerPoint. We previously presented to the utility subcommittee. Uh, the ordinance in front of you, which is available on the table if it's not already been if it's distributed in the packet, does principally two things. It proposes a, revi a revised method for calculating utility revenue distribution to the municipality, and it makes a corresponding change to the way MUSAs are calculated. And we'll get into both of those in some detail. So I thought it might be helpful to start at the absolute beginning here. So we're all familiar with AWU, MLP, and SWS. The first trivia question that comes in the presentation is how many utilities does the municipality have? The answer is not three. The answer is actually five because AWU operates as two utilities. It is the water utility and the wastewater utility. They have different certificates of public need and convenience, so water and sewer. And likewise, solid waste services is two utilities. It has the collections operation, we put your garbage out, the garbage trucks come, and the landfill, refuse collection. Of the three utilities, uh, stepping back and going very big picture, a reminder, this is the municipality writ large, size of Delaware, running all the way from Connick to Portage. But there is a mismatch between the, mis the municipality and the citizens and taxpayers and the scope of the service areas in which the five utilities operate. So AWU has the water utility, which covers most of the bowl, most of Chukiak Eagle River, but there are a lot of people who are on wells in South Anchorage. Likewise, the wastewater utility covers a whole lot of the area, but there's still people on their septic systems on the hillside. MLP is well known. Their service area more or less corresponds to the old city of Anchorage before we unified in 1975. The garbage collection utility has a similar service area, that goofy air line that you can see sort of uh, collecting all of the blue and red polygons, I think is the old city service area. And then the landfill, which is the disposal <coughs> utility, can be thought of as area-wide, but even there, there's a little bit of a mismatch because it isn't just Anchorage residents that are using the landfill. People can come in from the valley and make deposits too. So that sets up this first philosophical point which is that there is a difference between the citizen taxpayers of Anchorage and the ratepayer service users of the various utilities. And sometimes that can create a tension. The municipality <coughs> could operate all of the utilities at a very subsidized cheap cost, but then folks in Bear Valley would be subsidizing the garbage collection in downtown. Or the municipality could raise all the utility rates sky high, but that's not likely to work either because then you're causing a mismatch between folks who are in the service areas versus those who are out. So one way of resolving this tension 
how to deal with the fact that the municipality has invested all this capital and taken on all this risk to operate utilities that are only operating in a subset of the municipality writ large is to treat them the way we do, like real no kidding businesses which are wholly owned by the municipality and which can return some kind of dividend or distribution back to the muni. And that's the way we have had it wired for a very long time. So in the Anchorage Municipal Code, the utilities are supposed to be paying something back to general government. And that's completely consistent with the state statutory regime. The state statute says when we are engaged in rate making, the rate making for a utility that is owned by a municipality is entitled to include a reasonable rate of return. And then that reasonable rate of return should generate some profits or some surpluses which would get distributed back to the municipality according to its bylaws or ordinances. So we have an ordinance. So under the state law, the way it should work is if a municipal utility has some surplus revenues, those revenues get pledged to the general government for the next year. There is a cap on it, and the cap is the total amount of the utility revenue distribution for the subsequent year can't be 5% of the utility's gross revenues. That is a little bit strange because if you have surplus revenues or profits, why is the cap tied to gross revenues, which may actually eat away all of your profits? But in any event, under the state statute, this should be the end of the story, but it is not the end of the story because there is another player here, and that player is Regulatory Commission of Alaska. So this takes us back to Progressive Area, Progressive Era, Teddy Roosevelt. We have certain businesses that are natural monopolies, and you build your house you're not gonna get to choose between brand X electricity and brand Y electricity or brand X water and sewer and brand Y water and sewer. You only have one set of pipes, one set of overhead power lines, and that makes a whole lot of sense, but if it is a natural monopoly, thinking goes, there should be someone looking out for the rate payers, make sure those monopolies aren't just bilking people. And in Alaska, generally, after the Public Utility Commission was rebranded, that is now the Regulatory Commission of Alaska, and in its charge, they are responsible making sure that those rates, terms, and conditions are reasonable. Not all of our utilities are actually regulated by the RCA. SWS, is two utilities are out, but the MLMP and the two AWU entities are in. And I'll digress here for a moment just to say that's a little bit potentially odd. The, the way the state is set up, the utilities run by the municipality already have somebody that's looking out for the rate payers in the municipality, and that's you guys. So the statute sort of defaultly says public utilities that are owned by the political subdivisions are exempt from RCA oversight, except there's this funny exception that says if a utility or electric operating entity is owned by a political subdivision and it's competing with some other utility, then that electric utility gets sucked into RCA oversight, and so do any of the other utilities that municipality is operating. And I think and I don't know this history, but I think the animating concern must be that when MLMP is selling excess power to Golden Valley and Chugach also has electric excess capacity, the <coughs> RCA, the state legislature, doesn't want us winning that battle every time by subsidizing MLMP through profits made at AWU, which has never actually happened in the real world, but I think that must be the concern, that there's gonna be some weird cross-subsidization so that when we go head-to-head -head with other non-municipal entities, we have somehow arranged to give ourselves always a win. In any event, whatever the motivation, the truth is all of our utilities are now sucked into RCA oversight, except that the commission can issue an exemption when they say we just don't need to be involved, and that's what's happened for SWS. Long ago, they said we can issue a public interest exception. The assembly is fully capable of regulating SWS. One other power that the RCA has, in addition to working on all the rate making cases, is this. When they find that the capital of a public utility is impaired or might become impaired, then they can say you must stop paying dividends until the capital impairment is removed. And this is what really brings us here today because this has happened. Uh, in order to make sense of this, there's one notion to introduce. The way they talk about whether capital is impaired or not is by referring 
to the equity debt equity ratio or the capitalization and it's typically a number where you put equity on one side debt on the other so if you have 44 and a half percent equity or 50 and 55 and a half percent debt you would say the equity ratio is 44 and a half percent or 44 and a half percent July 2015 a lot of us are new to the building we get an order from the RCA that says we are turning off the municipality's dividends from MLMP. And this is consequential not only because it was totally unexpected, but because it's real money. They said, we did not find that MLMP's capital ratio isn't compared now. They were at the 44.5%. But Plant 2A was coming on, and we had an equity management plan that showed that our equity was going to drop, although it was going to be stable, it wasn't going to go to zero. And they said, we're concerned that it might become impaired. That had a real financial consequence. From 2006 until 2015, the municipality was receiving, in general government, upwards of $6 million, and in the latest year, $7 million, which is money that cannot be replaced by taxes, because the tax cap says the total amount of taxes levied can exceed what you levied last year, adjusted for inflation and population. The MLMP dividend is outside of the tax cap. So when that $7 million winks out of existence, there's really nothing general government can do other than tighten its belt and figure out how to make do. This was not the first time this had happened. In fact, all the way back in 1980, the RCA had turned off the dividends for both of the waste of, of the AWU entities. And here, this was, I wasn't around back then, but potentially less surprising because the AWU entities really were sort of teetering on the edge. I think they're capital, their equity ratios, they were in the low single digits. And since 1980, the municipality has never received anything from operating the AU entity, other than IGCs and other things. So this was the history then of the RCA's involvement with MLMP. Uh, it was actually not the first time it happened in MLMP. In 1987, MLMP had gotten all the way down to about 5%. The RCA turned it off. 1990, the municipality went back and said, hey, we're all the way up to 13%. And the RCA said, you got to be kidding me. Come back when you have real equity numbers. In 2005, we did go back with 40.4, and they said, good enough for us. And then, quite unexpectedly, in 2015, we were still looking good. We didn't even know that turning off the distribution was even at issue in a rate-making case that we were proceeding in. But we get this order that says, you're going too low. And that's the order. Um, Jumping into how they reached the decision they reached. So the top line was that in all of these RCA proceedings, MLMP participates, the state participates through RAPA, the public interest uh, defender, and then interveners who tend to be interested large rate payers can also get involved. Here, Providence Hospital intervened, and they said, it's just totally inappropriate for the municipality to be paying itself dividends if the capital is going to fall below 30%. And the RCA seemed to bite on that. They said, you know, it's, the equity is going to decrease until it's a little bit below 30, and then it's going to stay below 30 until 2023. Um, they said that MLP was projecting a 28.3%. There's some quibbles about that number and whether it includes the whole of the balance sheet or the electric sheet only. But in any event, that was the story. And and this was also a very interesting piece of the puzzle, where they said, unless we, the RCA, turn this off, we're not confident that the municipality is going to be thoughtful or be able to constrain itself. That the code says you can take up to 5% of gross revenues, but in practice, we think they're always going to take up to 5% of gross revenues, regardless of what that does to the utility, regardless of what that, whether that makes sense, regardless of whether that consumes all the profits or not. So they were reading this as not just permission to go to five, but a sign that the municipality is just going to do it. So um, why are we here at this time? Not only is this sort of the end of the MLP story, it's also a setup for the water utility. The water utility is now before the RCA in a new rate making case. And as part of that rate making case, they have indicated that Though they have been under a capital dividend restriction since 1980, they're doing good. They're at an equity level above or at 33%, which is their internal goal. They've been there since 2012. And that the new rates they are proposing anticipate that their dividend would be turned back on. So we think that if there's a chance to make 
to build a better mousetrap, now might be a timely time to build a better mousetrap. So here's what we are proposing. 2007-97 does this. It says, RCA, first and foremost, we hear you. We're not just going <coughs> to set the dividend according to some turn the crank number without being thoughtful about it. And we're going to propose a new regime. So instead of if you have surplus profits, you can take up to 5% of gross revenues, instead we will say, you have to have a real process. So the amount of the utility revenue distribution first has to be proposed by the utility with some kind of real no kidding report. And that's a change right now. In recent years, it's just been an AR that's been a one page, one sentence thing that says, the amount of a utility distribution for MLP is whatever dollars and it's moved into general government and there's not a lot of supporting data there. And this report would have some real thoughtful consideration in it. So it would talk about the utility's current equity, what its returns on that equity are, if they've missed their targets, what the effect of that um, distribution would be on their ability to hit their targets, um, the effect of a distribution on their capital structure to the extent that the RCA is really caring about that number. And ultimately would require the utilities to say, and we think this distribution is actually prudent and consistent with business-like operation of the utility. I hope that this sets up a kind of healthy tension between the utilities and general government, because of course left to their own devices, the utilities are always gonna say the best distribution is zero, and then maybe left to its own devices, they four would always say, give us everything you got. But I think a real process here could surface a sensible number that would be the business operating as a business saying this is what we think our owner is entitled to and which gives us the best shot of operating this business prudently going forward. Now this could have been it. This could have been the whole of the new proposal for the ordinance because this is more akin to the way commercial boards operate. There aren't often, I'm not aware of any, turn the crank formulas that determine what a private sector business is gonna distribute every year. But we understand there may be a little bit of a lack of trust between the municipality and the RCA here. So we have built in some additional safeguards, and as many of you are, I'm sure, are scholars of antiquity, you may be familiar with this Ulysses Pact <laughs> concept. There's a moment in the Odyssey where Ulysses is going by the sirens. He really wants to hear what they sound like, but he knows if he hears, he's going to lose his mind, he's going to jump in the water, he's going to drown, he puts wax in all of his ear, the men's ears, and they tie him to the mast. Is whatever I do, don't let me go, so that he can hear what the sirens say. So if you think that a process that allows the assembly to hear one whisper of money from the utilities is going to lead us to completely lose our minds and drown the utilities and go down with the ship, then we have built in what we think are some safeguards. We are tying ourselves to the mass. So we have said, instead of now saying the max that the distribution can be is 5% of gross revenues. We're saying gross revenues, we're getting out of that business. We'll be looking at profits. The equivalent of profits for the utility is the change in net position. And we'll say, even among the profits, we're always gonna leave something on the table. So we're gonna cap it at 75% of the change in net position. And this is actually potentially commercially unreasonable. There are a whole lot of businesses that do not operate that way. Our neighbors, Caddy Corner across the street, Conico Phillips, just by one example, 2016, lost three and a half billion dollars in one quarter and four and a half billion dollars for the whole year and still declared dividends every quarter in 2016. And that's partly because they're working towards their owners' expectations, but also because they can project out into future years and say we'll be profitable again someday. But whatever, and to the extent that we are trying to build trust, we'll say fine, we're gonna cap our own hands, we're gonna leave some money on the table, 75% of change in net position. And that's not all. Uh, we do have some fail safes here, and these I think are placeholders for a distant time in the future. We do say we could go beyond the 75% of change in net position if we ever got really well capitalized, if we were like 65%, which would be pretty off the charts for a publicly traded, for a public utility, or if there was ever a time that the RCA said, as long as you're over 50, you're fine. They've never done that, and they're probably never going to do that, but a man can dream, so we put that in the ordinance too. Um, and even in those scenarios, we would want the utilities to say, we have too much equity, it's not necessary, or the RCA target is appropriate and we'll move. So, so that's the general regime. But here are the other additional fail-safes. We will not take any distribution 
if we have not made any money, so that's actually kind of a repeat of section two, um, if our equity percentage has fallen less than 30%, and that's a real hard cap that doesn't exist anywhere in the RCA rulings or in the private sector, but we pick that number because we think it is a pretty good place to say it is hard for anyone to reasonably object that the utilities capital is impaired if it is above 30%. Partly it's because that was the number that was floating around in the, in the RCA's order that turned off the MLP dividend. That seemed to be what the RCA itself was biting on. But it's also because our own experts in those rate making cases have said, we've canvassed the landscape and utilities are maintaining investment grade bond ratings, meaning the market thinks they're fine, with equity ratios as low as 22%. And as compared to our neighbors, not only are we doing good, but 30% would be totally fine. So in 2014, MLMP calculated these ratios for all our neighbors. If you cut us off at 30%, we would still be above all of our immediate neighbors and much healthier than they. So 30%. Um, if the utilities bond rating ever actually falls below investment grade, so the market is thinking we're teetering on the edge, all right, we'll shut it off then. And of course, if the RCA ever says you can't do it, then we won't do it. Um, the last is the end of this new process with these fail safes would, as it has always been, result in a hear or an approval in front of the assembly itself. There's one more piece to the ordinance, and this I think is in the vein of housekeeping. The municipalities' utilities are tax exempt entities because they are an organ of us. If they were privately owned by an Avista or a private utility, they would be paying property taxes. So for a very long time, we have assessed to the utilities a municipal utility service assessment, and it feels like a payment in lieu of tax. It is calculated first by applying the mill rate in the service area in which those assets are to the net classified plant in service. So you're taking kind of the book value of plant 2A multiplying by the mill rate it would pay if it was in the service area and was taxable. And that is remitting the use of to us. But there is this weird, I won't say weird, there is this extra component of MUSA. In addition to that thing that feels a lot like a real no kidding payment in lieu of tax, the MUSA has also had this additional one and a quarter percent of your actual gross operating revenues component for some, but not all, of the utilities, for some reason that doesn't apply to SWS refuse, but applies to everybody else. Again, I don't really know the original history on all of this, but I do know that as the RCA has looked at the grand total calculation for what MUSA is and said, there's a thing that looks like PILT, and there's this other thing that looks like one and a quarter of your gross revenues, they have said the portion that is based on gross revenues seems a lot like an equity distribution to us. And when AWU's dividends were turned off in 1980, they said, if you're not getting dividends, you can't pay that portion of MUSA either. So without any great justification for why MUSA is written that way, we said, fine, we get it. We're just getting rid of all that. So we're only going to do MUSA that feels a lot like a true pill. We just get rid of that altogether. The last piece of the story is that as we are hopefully resetting this relationship between RCA, demonstrating that we can be thoughtful and considerate and not just reactionary about how we're calculating these utility dividends. It may also be a helpful fact that while water is undergoing its rate making case and asking for the dividend restriction to be lifted, wastewater is also going through a rate making case and its equity ratio is also targeted to be 33% and they're there but we don't even want a dividend from them because the utility has said, now's not the time. We want to get a little healthier. I don't know if their capital program just doesn't accommodate it. In any event, we have now on the books a rule that says if you're over 30, you could get a dividend. But we are serious that we're going to look at the real needs of the utility. So RCA, even while we are adopting that rule, here's us acting like responsible individuals. One of our utilities is already at 33%, and we don't think it's ready for a dividend. That's the presentation, and I'm happy to answer questions, although there are many more knowledgeable people in the room than I Question from the members. Mr. Croft. Did, did we typically go to that 5% at that in our history that we took the 5% of gross revenues? I think Mark Johnson's probably the best person to answer that because the answer that was a question that was asked during the hearing, and the answer was always. 
So that we chart just, we had never asked for anything other than five percent. And we're currently not getting five. We're not getting uh, a dividend from ML and P or AWU, but we are getting dividends from both sides of solid waste and the Port of Anchorage, in which is not really a utility for this at the five percent level in the mechanism uh, that Bill explained that's in the current code. So we we kind of had this zero or five percent. We didn't operate too much in, in between. It sounds like. I, yeah, it's certainly the case that between 2005 and 2015, when the dividends were turned on, it was always 5%. Whether there was hard thinking about it in somewhere that didn't show up in assembly documents, I don't know, but the dog is not barking in a way that anybody can see. So, we're here. Yeah. Thank you. Pete. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, um, have, have we run any of, of, this, of these changes past the RCA to see if they might have uh, some input in, into uh, how we should structure or restructure this, or wh where did we come up with the idea to, to restructure it in this way? Uh, through the chair, the answer is no, and partly because I'm not sure there is really a mechanism to go to the RCA to say, can you bless this dividend formula or not? The practice before the RCA has always been bring me a rock and I will tell you if it is the right rock and they will never tell you what the real numbers are. So for instance in this, if we had a clear indication or a clear ruling from RCA that 27.5 is the number they consider to be the equity impaired or not equity impaired cut we can just use that. But they haven't said that and all indications are they will never say that. They will only tell you what you have is either good enough or not. Um, I suppose there could be some extraordinary measure to Query the RCA, but I, but I don't know that that's really the dynamic we would want to set up in any event. I think we want to set up what we think is the defensible, smart, intelligent process. And if the RCA thinks that we have missed the mark, certainly they can and will tell us. But in the first instance, you guys are the legislators, right? Thank you. Other question with assembly members. Yes, John. Well, following up on that, I, I mean, my impression on this was that it was the main intent was to <coughs> convince the RCA that we'd be grown up. Properly, so yeah. is there some way to stop it to that market if it's not the current commissioners? Maybe there's a past commissioner, or maybe there's an attorney that works with them. Sure 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 this well, one little point. Uh, so the best way I can answer that is twofold. Uh, first, we have shopped it with at least our experts. So we have shopped it with the regulatory council for MLD and for ALU, and they definitely approved the initial drafts. It moved a lot from getting from the beginning to the end. And everybody feels pretty good about the product. I don't think there's a way to go to the commissioners outside of a proceeding and ask for their <coughs> ideas. But certainly, if we were to pass it now or in the near future, we'll potentially find out what the RCA thinks as part of Waters' rate making case, because as, as well as ours, and potentially yours as well too. All right. Anything else, John? Well, I guess we're just a quick one here. When you say investment grade, is that um, well defined? I will. Def someone tells me that's a term of art. So sure. uh, it's a term of art. Thank you. Um, and it uh, references um, the rating that a bond is given. So a or B would be um, investment grade. A junk bond status would not be investment grade. Where is that? Is that a bond? B minus. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I think those are probably all investment grades: the Bs and the As. If it's below that, then they just call it junk, and, and nobody touches you. And everyone understands that. Yeah. yeah. The market certainly understands that. Anything else, John? I don't think you know. Mr. Gates, sir. Um, excellent presentation, Mr. Rossi, as usual. I have a question about some of the code language. I was just concerned the meaning of this one part um, in your 065 uh, A3A. I could ask, just for clarification, this is the one that says the dividend uh, distribution. Zero if the utilities change in that position with the prior release negative and uh, left for not. And I'm just kind of uh, hypothetical thinking, suppose last year we saw five million in that position, um, and this year's 
forward and then 150,000, just 50,000 get up next. That's a negative change. Does that mean it has to be zero? We could only have a nice net. The legislative intent is definitely no, and this is the same question I got from someone who has a quarter office in the eighth floor. It reads awkwardly because change in net position is the closest term to profit for the utility. So we are intending it to read at zero if the utility's profit for the prior year is negative. But there is a slight linguistic ambiguity the way it's written now using the real term of art because you could interpret it like Dean was saying. Last year I made $10, this year I made $9. My change in net position is negative. But it's not, the, net, the change in net position is int intended to be the whole of the profit. Not change in net position from the prior, prior year, but change in net position for the prior year. Right. In the prior year. Right. Anything else, Mr. Gates? John? Yeah, just said, what, what if um, the MLMP sold their share in the South Central Power Station, sold it for broken bucks, and made a lot of money? Um, look at that. And then your capital was down, you got a lot of cash. I don't know what that does to your equity ratios. I know that the way our charter is set up, well, actually, that's a great question. Uh, the way the charter is set up, you sell a utility, it all goes into the MOA trust, and that's all well defined. If you sold an asset of the utility, which is not actually the utility, I think we're in a little bit of uncharted waters. Um, but the asset is owned by MLP, so that sale would return cash to MLP. So, well, uh, basically, if the asset is worth a hundred dollars and you sell it for a hundred dollars, you have the same amount of equity because your equity is in cash instead of in in an asset plan. But don't and sell it; you can make money. So suppose you sold it for two hundred dollars. Now we got lots of cash in there. We need to pay for the sole arena. Well, strangely <laughs> enough, uh, with SPP, we have an agreement with Chuyet because they are the co-owner that if we decide to sell it, they have first right of refusal and they pay the uh, net book value. So if it was on the books for a hundred million dollars and we wanted to sell it, we would end up selling it to them for a hundred million dollars. Show. Yes, Tim. What if the, um, uh, as, as we talked to the utility enterprise committee, um, what if the relationship between Chugach Electric and MLP changes the, the structure of that, of that organization, other than MLP? Um, I suspect that will have an influence on. The Public Utilities Commission would, uh, uh, would rule on how they would look at things in terms of what the municipality might be able to take out of it. Uh, if the structure of the utility changes, certainly that will scramble a lot of things, but I'm not sure it will change this at all because either we will end up, I think the scenario is we, we wouldn't own an MLP, in which case this is now applying just to AWU and the SWS, or we would own something that is MLP that's different. And the rules would be the same. We would ask how much its equity ratio is and how it's doing, and we'd be thoughtful about what distributions we could get. If uh, if there was some sale that resulted in radically different equity ratios for the utility and different rates, I suppose the RCA could use that as the opportunity to say dividends are being turned on or off. But otherwise, I don't I don't know that it would strictly change any part of this presentation. As a follow on, uh, uh, Catch Electric, I suspect it's also under has the, the, they have the oversight of them as far as the infrastructure of public utility. Uh, and are our way of dealing with those things the same as, as Chugach Electric and LMP and Chugach Electric? I think I'll take a first stab at this and maybe I'll ask Mark to help me. But I think the answer is no, they're not the same, in part because Chugach is a co op and so he doesn't pay dividends so in the same way dividend. at all. Um, we looked for a model, just to an off the shelf plug and play, what can we steal from somebody else? And so far as we can determine, the model is someone makes a presentation to the board, justifies a number, and away we go. So we didn't find any alternative view that we could steal. Um, 
think that's about the best answer. Yeah. Chugach, uh, their income uh, goes into capital credits, so their equity, and they, the board decides on an annual basis if they're going to retire capital credits, thereby pay a dividend back to the owners of the utility. And they normally go back, I believe, they keep the capital credits for about 18 years before they give the money back. So if you are a member of Chugach, you will potentially get a dividend on an annual basis, but not always. And that dividend, if you continue to be a customer 18 years on, they will put it through as a credit on your bill. And then if it is, if you're no longer a customer, they will attempt to find you and pay you that money in the form of a check. Do they pay a property tax? They pay zero. Well, that's not exactly true. They pay some because they own some uh, property that I believe is leased, and as a result of that, they pay a portion of that. But as a co-op, in general, they are uh, exempted from property taxes. And the footnote on that is that's totally correct. They don't pay property tax. They also have to pay this utility co-op fee to us, which is, I guess, supposed to be some compensation for their being non-taxable, but it is really low. It is nothing close to what they would pay if they were paying property tax. Question of some members. Yeah, this was a I'm sorry. A um, couple of questions. First, we've, we've had AWU in, in a different structure over time. That is how we operate it, what, what the management oversight structure is. That, if we did that again, that wouldn't change any of this. It's still a utility owned by the municipality. How we management or interact with their management isn't, isn't affected by this or is it? I think the answer is that's correct, that it wouldn't change this. That Right, I mean, if we stood up a new independent AWU board, perhaps you would make the case that this gets routed through the board and then the board was, I don't know, maybe it would be mechanically you would do something a little bit different, but otherwise it wouldn't change and still it would be a, Business holding a certificate of public need and convenience from the day of the utility bill. And at various times um, in, in these kinds of ideas, we've confused the idea of an upper limit and a target. That is, what we will never go past versus what we want to hit regularly. Sort of, which is this 75? What we would like to regularly do or what we are never accepting the exceptions you listed going to go on. I think the honest answer is in the new paradigm, we have no idea what we would like to regularly do, and the 75% of net change in position, change in net position, is supposed to be the cap, not necessarily the target. If everything was going gravy, maybe that's the number you'd get, but I suspect it wouldn't be, at least in the near term. And then one, one last kind of follow up on that. On these kinds of things, sometimes government has been floated, it's part of the permanent fund calculation, the dividend calculation is, you don't use just one year because that's too variable for government and it's, you, you ride highs and lows too much, you do some sort of five year of what is essentially profit. Would you guys consider that for this to sort of level us out? I think the honest answer to that is we did not give that a lot of serious consideration, but it's not a terrible idea. Or at least as I stand here now, I can't figure out why. It's not <laughs> All right, we can work on it. It looks like uh, Ravi Roberts going to tell you why it's terrible. Well, uh, thank you, um, <laughs> Mr. Chair. So one of the things I think Mark or um, Brett or Mark can talk about this is that in typically in the utility business, those uh, revenue streams are fairly consistent year in year out. Um, there's small fluctuations, but I think it probably be fairly small. And I don't know if that's supported by what you guys are thinking. In the history of the 5% gross revenues anyway, that was, I don't, I don't know how that translates to profits, but at least the 5% of gross revenues that MLMP kept paying out, that was a pretty stable number over time. Well, I can see why gross revenues would be stable in budget. Right? Some big fluctuation in that would be really uh, unusual with that. But it, it seems like you can have a year where you hit zero or you hit negative for, for just a minute. And then it pops back up, and rather than going five 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 zero five, I'd rather do four. And yeah. um, right. okay. 
And then we take a look at Lance told us here, we're looking at about $20 million deficit for this coming year. This 7.102 would have made a nice chunk of cut that. And the first of all, how that come in, we've got to have something because we're going to have this paradigm just keep building on this every year. Lock of money. Anything else from the semi We keep picking up, we keep picking up uh, the cost from the state. It's only going to get worse. It shifted shaft, according to my friend. I guess the follow, yeah. up, follow it up on Dick. So, so we do this and maybe modify a bit, whatever it passes, and now we got this thing. And the intent is now we show RCA, look how serious and good we are. Why don't you let us have a dividend? Is yeah. that the plan? I think that would be the plan. Uh, AWU is certainly set up for that right now, and they would be in the posture of saying we're at 33%. We think that is not impaired. We have a new regime that provides a floor that we're never going to fall below 30. So if your standard RCA is, you can turn us off when we are impaired or might become impaired, you should have some strong confidence that neither of those things is true. Okay, so if we do this, um, would it give a yes or no in time for next year's budget? Or is it something for 2019? It's most likely something for 2019. The petition to lift the dividend restriction, our intent is to file it once this is passed. We're working on putting it together, but we wanted to make sure that we do include this code language and that we can justify it to the RCA. But the timeline for the RCA making a decision on it is 180 days. So we won't have it before the 2018 budget passes. Thanks. This is a long term. Yeah. If we don't start nibbling away, we're just going to be Whenever I deal with RCA, I keep thinking about the old ABC board terms called arbitrary and capricious. With RCA, I think that is uh, when they say you're, you're impaired or you think you might be impaired. Try to define what you think you might be impaired. Whether they got far into one or yes or not. Anyway, other minds on. Anything else, Bill? I think that may be it. If there are Anything else from the other members? members? The public want to discuss this with us a couple minutes? Want to see anything? Yes, public all of course. In spite of him trying to spell it with you. Anybody want to say I think we are uh, available to answer any questions you have, but other than that. No. You're, you're not paying enough, are you? I mean, you should be paying Chairman, I would just add that, that uh, Good. this ordinance will assist greatly in the conditions of local the demonstration because it gives the, uh, the RCA a, a much uh, firmer basis on, on uh, how we might have the decision to pay attention. I think it would be very useful. Thanks for being here.